All right, everybody, welcome. So we're going to, um, I guess, continue the conversation we've been having all afternoon. Um, we've touched on a lot of things. I want to go back to some of those things and maybe try to get in a few areas we haven't talked about quite yet. But obviously, the, uh, the elephant in the room um, is, in my opinion, Effie, your sharks. Um, I think the, uh, and I'd like to start there, in this whole conversation about the blockchain vision, about the idealism versus the pragmatism, and um, how we can, um, are we getting co-opted or not? Um, I mean, it seems to me when, when, when I got involved in blockchain, right, it, it, it seemed to me there were two paths. You, either you use this technology to do what you're already doing just better and more efficiently, okay, which is what I think a lot of the, a lot of the banks were looking at in the beginning. You know, you're gonna cut off, um, cut off a lot of, uh, Operational costs, you can, you, can, you can build a better, more secure system with less, less, uh, less friction, et cetera, et cetera, but to keep your old business model going. Then, of course, there was the idea of starting these, um, coming up with real um, decentralized peer-to-peer -peer new business models, you know, get disintermediation on a large scale. Now, it seems to me when I look at your sharks that we're in danger of um, ending up on, in number one, okay? Is that what we want? And if not, how can we avoid it? I'll start with you. First of all, it is um, something that uh, keeps me up at night. Where are we at? Because we are running that risk of simply replicating um, the existing system in, in another asset class, and that is definitely not what we wanted. We don't mind if that's a, a transition that we have to, to walk through in order to attain what needs to be attained because like with every technology, culture comes first and, and we need to work on that, on changing uh, the, the culture, which is huge in this case because we'll have to change um, how we think about money and wealth and how we organize and collaborate because that's this. So I, you know, the, the, the finance people, the banking people, can't do it alone. It has to be a much, much bigger effort um, uh, than that. So it can't be Seba Bank alone educating retail or institutional. It has to be everybody together. So yes, we are at risk for this, and each of us has to bear that in mind while we're moving forward in the small steps that are difficult steps uh, to do. So that, that's my opinion. So you want to give it a shot? Of course, Goldman Sachs is always the number one. They, they always know how to exploit uh, new regulations. They're really well connected politically. And that's uh, maybe in 100 years different, but the next few decades is probably going to be like this. Feudalism. Uh, you know, it, we, the, the system today isn't a whole lot different. We have 80, just the 80-20 rule, you know, 80% uh, or 20% or of the population owns 80% of all the assets. Um, you know, 80% of GDP is produced by 20% of the population. It's even more stark these days. And um, so free of any ideology, there's just, just certain laws that allow smart people to accumulate more wealth. Today, it's even way more extreme. 1% owns 50% of all the assets in the world. You know, and that doesn't mean that somebody today who is at the bottom 50% is worse off than they were 100 years ago. They're way better off, you know? But what we are saying is we don't care about Wall Street, this and that. I was on Wall Street, Morgan Stanley, you know, I, I relate to that community. I don't think, I mean, they're self-serving like any other human being, but the point that I want to make is that uh, our solution, what we're saying is the bottom 80% or 50% or whatever, we just want to help them, not the very bottom, we can't help them, but the middle section, we help them to uh, get a little bit better, uh, independent of Wall Street or you know the bad guys or, or whatever, free of any ideology. Yeah, it's, it's a, a multi-dimensional question. Um, I start with the most pragmatic uh, answer. I think when, when anyone who is now dealing with these uh, companies that are emerging, and Sebo is one of those, as well as you, I think it, it needs to feel, fulfill certain criteria. And one of the criteria is it needs to be cheaper because this technology is much more efficient to be implemented. I mean, I've gone, I just mentioned before about the account opening. I mean, this is ridiculous. 
right? Uh, there's all these people saying we are, you know, democratization and, and, all, and the empowerment of the poor, but then when you have to open the account, you have to pay so much money. It's a joke. Uh, the other day, somebody came along with a fund. You know, usually you pay one percent these days. If you still, you know, if you cannot negotiate, they think it's three to five percent. The hurdle rate that Effie mentioned before, normally twenty percent. They even uh, charge thirty percent. A financing rate. You know, you mentioned uh, how much for fourteen. I think the market standard is at nine, but everyone else who doesn't understand, you know, they even pay up to 36%. That's the first one. The second one is frictionless uh, of that. And the third one, which people don't really talk about, making banking in one sense less relevant and on the other hand, more emotional. And the emotional meaning bringing the investor to the investment and the borrower to the lender. Um, maybe I come back to your initial questions a, a little bit. When we uh, was thinking about building our company, we looked into the current financial system. And I think the current financial system does not allow really to use the, benef the full benefit of blockchain. It is obvious that the sharks use the benefits like cryptocurrencies as a new asset class and the smart contracts to reduce reconciliation work. But they will never move and they are not, they are bound to a, an account and product centric, centric architecture. That's why we designed on blockchain a, a totally new architecture that is client centric that will allow to hold any kind of asset in his portfolio. Independent if the issuer will be a traditional shark, a new kind of bank or a piranha. Because I think there is, we need to bring the benefits for, of the blockchain first to the market before we can be, compete with the traditional banking system. Because I, I want to push this idea of new business models because I, we, 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 you know, people talk about them, but I don't get a lot of sense often in my work what these really are. So let me ask you, and um, really thinking, you know, blue sky, blue ocean, whatever you want to call about it. What's the most radical new kind of kind of state of banking that you can imagine? You know, assuming that we can do all the things with blockchain that we can do, decentralize it, and, and do us. You know, what 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 can we do that's really radically different? Okay, so, 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 so here, here, here's the thing. We, what we have, what we have. Well, let's let's go back a thousand years. You know, you had no intermediation, almost no intermediation at all. It was all direct peer to peer. You know, you took your chicken and you 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 got you know you got the cow back or whatever, and so th it's nothing under the sun. You know, we right now we have so many intermediaries. When I buy a stock, there's six to seven intermediaries on the buy side and six to seven on the sell side. Most people don't know this, and um, it's not necessary. It's just not necessary. But people still want to trust somebody. They, if if I lose my Bitcoin, then I want to go cry to somebody and, and and find out where the damn thing is. You know, because if I put it on some dump and I have to look for it, so people still want some guidance, you know, for the most part, maybe not that 7% of the geeks, but um, the, for me, it's just making the existing, existing system a little bit better. So I guess uh, for you, the main point is um, to shrink intermediaries, let's say to 90% of what we have today. For me, it would be, and I'm, I'm really thinking uh, right now what it would be, it would be two things. One, banking becomes completely invisible. Nobody really needs banking per se. We have all sorts of other needs. We want to buy a house, we want to educate yourself, you, you, you want to travel, whatever it is, and you are using banking to towards that uh, end. So can it become really invisible? Because right now it's transactional, right? 
It's not emotional at all. It's, how can I say, dry transactional. So it has to disappear behind the scenes, the transaction part, you know, that the thing you drive your car in the parking lot and it pays because it knows what time and blah, 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 all that uh, stuff. It pays your mortgage. It does everything that needs to be done. It alerts me because I don't have enough money to pay my kid's uh, school, you know, the private school he goes and suggests what to do and, and, and so on. And then artificial intelligence has to tell me how I'm doing because money is connected to my mental health, essentially if you think of it. So for me, that, if I can live for that, to see how, who can balance my mental health that's connected to my, what we call our financial wellness, then we're done. That's for me the perfect thing. Because both until you get to, to a financial state where, you know, you don't worry about uh, eating or, or, you know, your basic health insurance and so on, and the mass affluent and the wealthy, they all have this issue, which is the, the, the link between their mental health and their money financial life. So can banking become that in an invisible way? I was a bit reluctant because uh, I think money is money. I mean, y you look at the stuff, you move the stuff, and you work the stuff. And money in itself is just an intermediary because there is, you need to have a measure. Like you have a measure for time and length, you need to have a measure for value. And that's all what it is. And what we can do is basically connect it more to those things that are maybe emotional. I mean, if you look at the macro trend, is a f I'm from a generation where financial capital was very important because it gives you freedom. That was my, my parents taught me that. If you had some money on the side, at the end of the day, you're safe when you're old and you have certain freedom. The new generation, it's more about social capital. And not in the context of socialism, but in the context of a new economy. They're much more concerned about a fair world, about sustainability. And if you, there are even th theories out there, you know, if you go to feudalism and then from there to capitalism, it was about, you know, it was about um, people, land, and material. And they say the new Collaborative model, it's be very much about, now I have to think carefully about the term, but it's about the biothermical impact of Earth, right? Because it's all about global warming. And this is the highest capital that we have. But these sort of the thoughts that are working around. So maybe it morphs into something like that, how we see things, how we tax things, how we contribute the economy. But for the time being, it's look, move, work. For a certain time, I tended also to think that banking might disappear. But if, when I look at my growing kids, they had so much interest in these transactions that I have uh, big doubts. I think uh, Money must, must be easier to be handled in the future. And I like actually the approach to make it more emotional because in, in the school, school court it is emotional when they trade chewing gum, chewing gum against write, writing the, the whatever, uh, the notes or, or the, the, the work. And I think uh, there is a huge value creation opportunity in this. And I'm actually happy to see Seba is the first project where I see that the bank is going back into value creation. The current traditional banking system moved totally out of the wealth creation process. It's only managing and optimizing the wealth management. Mm -hmm. But if we want to have a better world, we need to enable our kids to create more value. 
And in that sense, it's probably not wrong what Banco Pactual is doing because they actually create new value with their, and I see a coexistence, uh, coexistence between the sharks and the, uh, the other, all other animals that are swimming around. Much like uh, what is happening, the transhumanism, where we are, you know, people and technology, I think this is happening also with you know, the, the sharks and, and the piranhas, you know, the, the, you, you see that blockchain technology is influencing how the uh, incumbents are doing business and, and moving their business forward and, and the other way around. We, we are there and we're going to meet in the middle the question of, you know, who's going to be the next Goldman Sachs or whatever, it doesn't matter but we are reshaping that. Hopefully we won't lose sight of the original mission and we won't stop moving at a point that is not worth, you know, a while. So, so first of all, I have to say, I, personally, I, I agree. I agree, especially about the emotional side. I agree about, you know, identity being, being, being bankable. Like you, there's a social aspect. There's an, an emotional aspect. But then I have to ask you, I have to ask you, but then the rest of you as well. Aren't you afraid of a Google bank and a Facebook bank? Can't they do that better? <laughs> Bill Gates, I think, was at the end of the 90s, said that banking is just a piece of software. Mm -hmm. And it's not about piece of software. Um, maybe, um, well, the question is, uh, and, uh, um, who presented that? Yeah, it was you. I mean, Facebook and Google, their, their business case is being challenged as well with the new technology. Right? So maybe we don't need to co uh, co be concerned about this, but it's really making sure that those people that are seeking for a service or of an asset, they have the truest form and the purest form to access this. So for instance, Bac Banco Pactuel, it's a noble thought, it's a great thought, but to Effie's point, you have to look at the terms and conditions. Right? And this is what, what we can really uh, change, um, but at the end of the day, as I said, money is, a, is an intermediary and it, it remains an, an intermediary function. This um, panel future banking and stuff, I need to talk about regulation a bit. So we talked a little bit about what's going on in the FINMA license and everything, but where, what would you like to see regulatory wise um, in Switzerland and, and globally, where's, where, where is it pinching? Okay, and in a perfect world, what would you like to see in terms of um, the regulatory landscape in three to five years when it comes to, to blockchain-based banking? Well, so in an ideal world, there shouldn't be any too big to fail. Regulation shouldn't be any Basel three, nothing, none of that. So there should be very little regulation, or maybe none at all. And then we would have a much more robust system. But we live in this world, and so for me, less regulation would be way better but at the same time, you have to protect investors, so it's, it's a tough call. I mean, I don't know if you have to protect investors. Maybe you can just say we're like nature, and if you're too dumb enough to invest in Jesus coin or whatever all these coins are, we, that's my, my, my son's opinion. He's a libertarian. He says the government isn't responsible for anything except education, and everything else you organize yourself. So it's a tough call. It's highly inefficient. That is my concern. We're wasting so many resources on regulation and rebalancing things and, and twiddling a little bit here, a little bit there, because it's too big to fail. And to your point, Effie, I see the banking to be, become invisible. That would be my dream, you know? But to be actually really benefiting the user, the non-informed banking client, and to actually deliver value to them, measurable value. And that is possible with today's technology. I have a very concrete uh, proposal. I want to see one regulator come up and say, I am going to use, deploy blockchain myself, and basically I won't need to, to play this uh, stupid surveillance ro role that is uh, you know, lagging three months and costs so much and is inefficient. So the surveillance role of a regulator can and should be replaced by blockchain. That's, that's the one thing that can be done and, and should be done. Yeah, it's, um, 
On the regulatory side, I mean, uh, I think the Swiss system, um, I like it. And because it's it's bottom up and it's not not top down, and I also think uh, our regulator is really applying common sense. If you talk sense, they 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 make sense out of it, and if you if you really prepared, they are also ready to act. Uh, so in many form or shape, I think our uh, legislation that we don't have a particular blockchain uh, law, I think it's good. And me, as SEBA, I have to show that to the regulator that with this new asset class and this new technology, I simply can fulfill the regulatory hurdles, right? The, also the standards. And which is fair, because there are two things. One is protection of the investor, and the second one is making sure that criminal money doesn't come into the system. That's all what it is. However, over, you know, over time, and it started off the Bretton Woods, 72, Every year is regulation, and it's a nature of government. It's a it's a nature of it's a law of the nature. I must say, if you have if you have uh, authorities, they are going to be creative. And with the blockchain moment, what happened is the kids and I said the blockchain company usually two guys and the pizza, so to speak. They don't think outside of the box because they have no box. And old guys like myself, I'm full of boxes. And what you have to do is now really go back and see why was that regulation implemented at the very first place? And how can this technology bring something to the table that the old technology wasn't able to do so? And if you go through this dialogue with the regulators and they understand and they have confidence that what you say you can do, then you probably have a have, um, uh, how you say that, a certain, certain support. Um, I once had a talk, the tyranny of smart contracts. And as a, originally a software developer, I don't believe in error-free software. So the day when the regulator is implemented in the blockchain, or we don't have a regulator anymore, I basically will change career and go back to software development. Because the, the, we have no escalation procedure yet inbuilt in the blockchain. And I mean, our legal system is built on escalation process that allow to find solution to continue living together. That was the original idea. Mm -hmm. Maybe we has, have lost that path. Okay, um, then I think what we'd like to do now is um, open, the, open the floor to questions from you guys um, for the panel. We have another, what, five or 10 minutes, I guess. Um, I liked your question according to the future of banking. I would say banking will be like in other areas, a service provider, um, which has partly taking care, is taking care of banking process, but also taking exchanges. And even outside the banking, there will be financial instruments, especially for the majority of the world, which don't use a bank. So I, um, what do you think about this approach to say um, banking will just be one block inside the whole trading ecosystem and losing a little bit his his uh, very um, sophisticated uh, priority role. But that may be well possible. Uh, um, <clears throat> the question, you know, uh, that was basically also your question in a, in a sense, right? Why do we need to have banks in a distributed uh, environment? And, 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 and I thought about this hard, and <laughs> my answer is, is very simple. The first one, Bitcoin, I see like, and I know I shouldn't say this because it opens a whole conversation. I'm very happy to have that, but it's like gold, you know? It's a very good settlement entity, but it's very bad for payments, right? So therefore, you need to have something in between. And the second one, the private key, you want to have it protected. And maybe that's the role of a bank uh, in, in three, five, 15, 20 years. 
And, and if you think, and then I want to do another statement here. If you go really back 120 years in the, in the big families, only the dumbest of the family went into banking because everyone else was on the field. And it was only the last 20, you know, 30 to 20 years where banking suddenly became so important. So with blockchain, we bring it back to something that is just an enabler, not the driver of value creation in itself. The organic uh, ecosystem uh, show us that uh, inside of an ecosystem we don't have mainstreams. We have a lot of relationship, we have trophic chains. And uh, here I see the future of the bank and the future of, uh, let's say, uh, public administration, fiscal administration. Uh, also they should be diluted inside of the, this new type of ecosystem where machine will play a, a more important role and based on uh, uh, artificial intelligence, for example, those institutions should be transformed themselves and should be part of the ecosystem. Yeah, I, I fully concur with you. Uh, I think uh, th there are two elements here. Um, the new players, as for instance, as SEBA, um, we have a cost basis that all the, the traditional banks cannot, uh, cannot compete, right? The second one is, and that goes a little back, back to Guido, is what is the ev eventual role of, 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 the, of the bank? And all the services around artificial intelligence, I'm not sure, do we really mean artificial intelligence? intelligence or do you do we talk about big data and machine learning and therefore we you know if it's just machine learning it's kind of pattern recognition and it just tells you uh, why don't you do this and why don't you call mommy and why the, have you spent that money I mean this is not transforming the real world but if you have read I would recommend people reading the Rip Gardner report about blockchain where it says from blockchain enabled to blockchain complete solution and um, it's amazing what potentially could happen and to basically to uh, to um, to Tom's point, very initial, we don't have an idea what distributed economy really means. It still needs to be founded. But the future role of banks may be, may be more advisory, in, in a sense, if, if the whole thing is, is running itself. Um, yeah, so for instance, advisory, uh, what is advisory? I mean, for instance, if people want to trade, for instance, with SEBA, and they have done a great week, right? They can see analytics, they see themselves. And say, what is an advisor? He said, why have you been great this week? Is it basically, is it timing or selection? So the system can give you all this and it goes to pattern recognition and, and big data and machine learning. But maybe, and this is the, a philosophical point in essence, highest intelligence cannot do any decision. So human beings will always apply intuition and that makes the difference. And, and that's why at one point there is always an advisory because data is not giving you the answer. You have to take the decision. It either comes from here, here or here. Yeah, basically what you're saying is that the algorithm can give the perfect information but doesn't really understand it itself. So if it tells me something, I can only interpret it and have a, con a context. They, you know, the algorithm doesn't understand. That's, that's the thing. So what I just heard is that it's more of an evolution as you see it. So you need time, you need to, time to um, educate the regulator and show him that what you're trying with this new technology is actually working and actually takes a lot of his work off his shoulders. Um, what is, and, and you also say that there's like a time frame where banks will be more advisors. And what, what is your time frame for that? Is there, a, do you have an estimation? What is your scope, your horizon? What is your hope maybe? Okay. Uh, when I went around with my slides for investors, the first slide it was started with Karl Popper. I'm not sure if you know this guy. It's a philosopher. And it's very much into faultism. 
And basically the answer, you know, my message was, we don't know where we go. We have a starting point and how we evolve, we have no idea. If you look at, if you think about context, the cryptocurrencies are 130 billion. If you look at the Gartner reports and some of the world trade, they say by 2026, um, through digitalization of assets, it's going to be a 20 trillion dollar market. And all this artificial intelligence, or however we're going to call, is going to be very quick in, in optimizing some of the decision making. Myself, I was involved in the transformation, digitalization of the FX market. From the idea for the implementation and the adaption of the entire market was three years. So sometimes it can happen very, very fast. So I'm not in the prediction business at all. <laughs> Just real quick, I don't think it's the regulator educating the regulator so much as it is uh, removing uh, different conflict of interest situations. The, um, if you go to a restaurant and you buy a meal and it's really good, it's a good value, you go back. It's really obvious. Um, you can, you, there, there is, there is uh, a level playing field between you and the restaurant. But with financial services, it's really complex and abstract because options, for example, deferred gratification, it does not exist in nature. So you need to educate, you need to remove, the, you, you have to create um, a, a balanced playing field where the incentives are aligned. It's going to take a long time to get a good portion of humanity there. You know, how long? I have no idea. But finance, it's inherently totally imbalanced. And also in, in banking and investing, there's this oxymoron that doesn't exist in, in other markets where the association of the quality of the product and the price is not like elsewhere. Like you buy a car, the higher the quality, the higher the price, the food, better food and so on, but with investments, because of all sorts of reasons, education is, is one of it, there isn't this uh, linear relationship between the quality of the product or the service and, and, and the price. So makes it even more complex, even with we throw out the regulation. So how do I know the value of the product that, or the service that you're selling me? It's, it's very complicated. Thank you. I think it, blockchain, it, we got blockchain as a tool that can remove intermediaries. But if an intermedi intermediary provides me value, I will keep it. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So my, if we look in as long as banks will be able to provide value to some of their customers, they will exist. And if for whatever reason, and maybe things that happen we didn't see coming, they cannot provide value, or if we have another, another financial crisis, things could fasten up very, or go much faster. But I think in the future, everybody, regulator, bank, Anybody has to provide value, otherwise he is out of the game. <laughs>